Okay, so we're about to embark on a fantastic six-week journey. It's going to be really fascinating. Judaism decoded the origins and evolution of Jewish tradition. This course is really a fundamental course. And I want to explain why it's fundamental before we begin. Um, the reason why it's fundamental, is it clear in the back? So the reason why this course is so important is because it's like so many things in life. There are so many things that I um, completely dismissed as like, uh, you know, either, either something I dismissed as nonsense or as irrelevant or whatever it is, all different types of things in my life. And then at some juncture, I was uh, compelled to confront that and investigate it. And when I investigated that, th that thing, this happened numerous times, I, I suddenly found that this is something which is, ha carries you know, real weight and is very significant. But it wasn't until I investigated and studied it that I actually began to value it. So it's really important that when we take things which are fundamental in life, um, that we can easily dismiss, that we also investigate it. Now, if we dismiss it as an educated consumer, so to speak, okay. We, 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 you know, we put in the effort, we understand what we're dealing with, and we make a choice. But to dismiss it without actually learning about it is simply um, not dealing with it. And the Torah, we know, is the essence, the core of the Jewish people. It's actually what makes us a people, the Torah. That's why God gave us the Torah in the desert, not in a land, not in Israel, not in America. Because what makes us the Jewish people isn't geography. It's actually one thing, it's the Torah. So we, need to, so we want to understand the evolution. In particular, the, the five of the six lessons are going to be talking about the oral law. And we'll discuss what that is soon. Um, and, and, and through going through this course, we will be educated on what the oral law is. What we do with that is then going to be our individual choice. And that's fine. But we first need to know what we're talking about. And we're going to jump right in, right now, by me asking you a question. Okay, what would you say if someone asked you, what is the holiest day on the Jewish calendar? What day would you say? It's not a trick question. Shabbat. Shabbat. Yom Kippur. Shavuos. <laughs> Shavuos. Shavuos. <laughs> okay. So many, um, uh, we're not going to argue which one is correct because that's not really relevant. But we had a big contingency over here saying Yom Kippur. Okay. So we're going to go with Yom Kippur for the sake of the point I want to bring out, not for the sake of whether it is or isn't the Holy Day. Let's get uh, some feedback on three observances or traditions or customs that are connected with Yom Kippur. Can someone give me something? Uh, Fasting. 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 Another. No, no, work. no work. Prayer. Breaking fast. Teshuvah, repentance. Okay, <laughs> breaking the fast. That's after the fast is over. <laughs> All right, but you think like a Jew. <laughs> okay, that's the main thing. Okay, great. So we have fasting, we have prayer, we have repentance. Excellent. Okay, let's start with the uh, most blatant of the three. Uh, the one that people are so much aware of is the fasting, although prayer is absolutely integral to Yom Kippur and Teshuvah is really integral to Yom Kippur. All right, let's talk about fasting for a second. How, where do we know, from where do we learn that we are supposed to fast on Yom Kippur. Where does that come from? The Torah. the Torah, right? Where else does it come from? Okay, well, where in the Torah does it come from? Well, let's find out, okay? So um, let's read text number one. And what we do, for those of you who are here for the first time, we, we move around the class with the readings. Okay, great. On the 10th of the month, we're not going to do any work. Which, which, wor which words over here tell us that we should be fasting on Yom Kippur? Afflict yourself. Excellent. Afflict yourself, right? In Hebrew, if you read the Hebrew, you'll see, and I'm going to focus on this one word. You don't need to read Hebrew, but I'm going to tell you that the Hebrew word for afflict is te'anu, te'anu, okay? Which means to afflict yourself. Okay. You're all good with that so far? Okay. Let's go to figure 1.1. And now, how would we know what te'anu actually means? Afflict. What does afflict mean? 
Does it mean to fast? So the, the, the simplest thing would be to go to other places in the Torah where we find the same word and see what it means there. And then we can understand what it means. That would be the simplest thing to do. So we're going to go to four other places in the Torah where it uses this word, and we're going to see what it means. Okay? So we have, there's the context is God speaks to Abraham and informs him about the future Egyptian exile. And what God says is, and they will enslave them, Abraham's offspring, and oppress, vi'inu, the exact same word, and oppress them for 400 years. Did the Jews fast for 400 years? No. no. They were whipped for 400 years. <laughs> they built pyramids for 400 years, right? Whatever it is. It was actually less, ended up being less than 400 years. But the point is, it doesn't mean to fast. Let's go to the next scenario. Context is Laban, the father-in-law of our, fa- of our forefather Jacob, whose two daughters were married to Jacob. He speaks to his son-in-law Jacob and makes a pact with him that now that you're leaving my household with my with my daughters and grandchildren, I'm making a pact with you that you should not te'ane, that you should not afflict them if you afflict my daughters. Now, what was he talking about? Probably domestic violence or something like that, right? He wasn't talking about fasting. Again, we see the same word. It doesn't mean fasting. It means something different than the first verse as well. And then we have um, Shechem, an individual rapes Dina, the daughter of Jacob, um, Jacob and Leah's daughter, right? And the, the verse there, the Torah says, Shechem, the son of Hamar, the uh, Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her. He took her, lay with her, and violated her. How do you think he violated her? By making her fast? <laughs> no, right? We don't need elaboration, right? Um, the point is, again, we find the same word, and it doesn't mean to fast. And you have another example also about oppressing a widow or an orphan. So clearly we see that when the Torah said, tells us about the observance of Yom Kippur, it is very unclear about how we should afflict ourselves. So where do we get this idea of fasting, which almost every Jew in the world knows about, if they're not, even if they're not observing it, right? Where do we get that from? How do we know what the Torah means when it tells us to afflict ourselves? It seems that there is information beyond the Torah that is explaining the Torah. In fact, most of Jewish law and Jewish observance is not explicitly defined in the Torah. And we're going to see that in numerous uh, numerous other examples as we go through the class. And now, this raises like a, a whole bunch of flags and questions. And in fact, many Jews... Um, throughout our history have had issues with the oral law. Because where are we getting this information from? Why should I be fasting for 25 hours? And this is a very legitimate question. Should I be fasting for 25 hours when the Torah doesn't even tell me to fast for 25 hours? And in fact, we find this going all the way back to um, the times of Hillel and Shammai. They lived about just about 2,100 years ago, if I have that right. But around that time they lived. And Hillel and Shammai were two great sages. They were living during the end of the uh, Second Temple. Okay? And the Talmud tells us a well-known story about an individual who wanted to convert to Judaism. Now, in general, do you think Judaism is, is an attractive proposition to a Gentile? I mean, you can just start with Yom Kippur, right? <laughs> Right. And, you know, keeping kosher. I mean, there are many things, there are many observances. It's just unnecessary for someone to choose to bring that into their life. Right. So if someone is choosing to convert to Judaism, they have a high value for what Judaism has to offer. They're probably very deep, insightful people as well. Um, and therefore, they're attracted to something. So the Talmud tells us a story. Let's read text number two. Now, the, the, the man's coming to Shammai to convert. He obviously values God. He values the Torah. He values the insights of the Torah in assisting a person in their life journey. right? And it has many answers. And yet, this, this non-Jew did not want to accept the oral Torah, only the written Torah. Why? Let's question for discussion on, on page four. Why was this prospective convert not willing to accept the oral Torah? 
let's come up with some very simple, what do you think is challenging about the oral Torah? What would your questions uh, actually be or theoretically be? Yeah. Interpretations. Interpretations. Like, this isn't God's uh, word. This is uh, some person's interpretation. Or a Torah means it's passed from person to person. It's like whispering down the lane. What starts in the beginning isn't always what you hear. It's Excellent. It's whispering down the lane. But by what we have, they're telling us now to fast. Yeah. But is that really what was going on 2,000 years ago? And I'm going to say in summary... Um, I, I can't even summarize. I'm not going to capture everything you said, but in summary, we're much more comfortable when we can see it black and white. We know what we're dealing with. This, in the beginning, yes, I, heard, I, I got that. I got that in what you said. And if you go to figure 1.2, I think this will include all of our questions. You know, why is the, the Torah, the Bible, alone insufficient? Why can't, what could be better than the Word of God? And I, and I want to mention actually two things here. There are two premises that we're assuming in this course, Okay. One of them is that there's a God, okay? So we're not going to be discussing that. We're assuming that. And the second is that the written Torah, which, we're going to be, which generally we're going to be pointing to the five books of Moses, the written Torah, is the word of God. Not inspired by God, but the word of God. Now, that we will discuss in lesson number six. But until lesson number six, you're going to have to ride along assuming that, even though I know that's, that's a challenging assumption for some of us, but that's fine. We're going to have to assume that, and that's what all of our discussions will be assuming that. We will discuss it in lesson number six, and that's a very important discussion to have. So if we have the word of God through the Torah, why do we need more than that? Who's the author of the oral law? Um, if it's the work of the ancient rabbis, is it relevant to 2015? The world is very different in many respects than it was then. Um, isn't the oral, oral Torah filled with debates. We're going to see one in a second, and how Hillel and Shammai dealt with this convert, potential convert, very differently. It's full of debates. You're not getting clarity out of debates. How does that help us? And can we have different opinions expressing the Word of God? The Word of God is the Word of God. Why should there be different opinions about what God has to say? And lastly, do we have the original message? Is it possible that the oral Torah had been passed down accurately for so many years? And that's the telephone game. Okay? So this idea that, you know, which we used the example of fasting, which is not explicit in the Torah, comes from some oral law. Well, that's very problematic, this whole oral law business, and makes us very, could make us very uncomfortable. Is everyone with me? Okay, I'm making sense so far? Okay, very good. Now, it's very likely that the convert or potential convert had many, if not all, of these questions. And that's why the convert wasn't ready to convert unless he was only converting on the basis of the written law and not the oral law. Now, what the convert didn't do, which we're doing, which is so fantastic that we have all chosen to do this, the convert did not investigate. It seems that the convert did not investigate the significance of the oral law, and we'll see how it's very, it seems very obvious he didn't do that. But here's something that's very important for us to pay attention to. Without the oral law, and this is why we need to investigate this, without the oral law, we can cut out half of the Passover Seder, the Pesach Seder. You know that? You know about the four cups of wine, right? Which help you get through the Seder, <laughs> right? So where does that come from? That's not written anywhere in the Torah. Matzah is. You're going to have to hold on to that matzah. But, uh, <laughs> but the matzah without the wine makes it... So, and there are many other things in the, uh, many other things in the Passover Seder. Um, Hanukkah candles. That's completely rabbinic because the whole holiday uh, was founded way after the Torah was given. Right? The whole story of Hanukkah happened way after the Torah was given at Sinai. So that's a completely rabbinic uh, commandment. Fasting on Yom Kippur, as we just investigated. Bar and Bat Mitzvah. Can you find anywhere in the Torah where it speaks about having a Bar Mitzvah? Explicitly. No. Right? So, we, and so here we clearly see that most of what we do, most of our observance or expression of Judaism is coming from the oral law. It's not coming from the written law. So it's very valuable that we're gathered together to learn what the backing of all of this is, because it's clear that we have, and that people can have many very obvious questions and problems with um, relying on an oral law. Um, and if you, I, actually, if you go into anything Judaism speaks about that in, in regards to human rights, charity, prayer, 
all of these things, um, most of it is, um, is developed in the oral law and the way we observe it. Okay, so let's, let me explain to you what we're going to be doing in this course. We're going to be discussing, four, we're going to break down oral law into four categories. And this is very important to understand. Because generally when we speak of oral law, we're talking about this mass of oral law, whatever that is. So we're going to really break it down into four sections of oral law so we can understand all of the elements of oral law. And tonight, we're beginning with one element of oral law. Okay, And that, we're going to call that the received oral law, and you'll see why in a minute. Okay, so what's Maimonides? You heard of Maimonides? Yes. Maimonides was the personal physician of the Sultan of Egypt. I think it was called the Sultan back then. Um, uh, he was a philosopher. He was a, a, a scientist. Uh, he knew astronomy, a, a mathematician. One brilliant, brilliant man. On his tombstone it says, From Moses to Moses, there did not arise like Moses. In other words... Because his first name was Moses, Maimonides. So we're talking about a, a man who is very well versed in many knowledges. And he explains that every mitzvah that God gave to Moses was given with its explanation. That means God gave the commandments in the written law, in the five books of Moses, and he gave an explanation. God would tell Moses the verse, verbatim, word for word, then tell him its meaning and explanation. And all that was contained in the ingenious wording of the verse. So what we see is that Moshe, Moses, got two pieces of information at Sinai. He got verbatim, word for word, the writing of the written law, which is the five books of Moses. And he wrote that down word for word without deviation. And then he received explanation on what he was writing down. That is what we are going to call the received oral law. Why are we calling it the received oral law? Because Moses received that in the very same way he received the written law. It was received from God. It is straight from God. It's very clear. It's just that for some reason, which we need to understand, God chose to give him this information orally and not in a written form. You with me? Okay, excellent. So if you go to figure number three, you're going to see that Number one is received, which is what we're discussing tonight. God given explanations for each of the commandments. How many of you are comfortable with, imagine if you were living when the Torah was given and Moses comes to you and says, here are the words God told me to write down and I'm going to explain it to you. This is how God explained it to me. Right? How, how comfortable are you with that? 80%, 90%, 20%. Assuming that you witnessed Moses as a prophet hearing the word of God at Sinai. Let's say you saw God speaking to Moses. Right? That's pretty good. Okay, pretty good. Okay, fine. So the, the point here is, this has nothing to do with rabbis. We do have the telephone game issue. Granted, we'll discuss that soon. But it was received. This is not anyone interpreting anything or deciding what affliction means in the Torah. It's no long white beards telling us that we should be fasting unless Moses had a long white beard. Um, but it was, uh, it was just Moses telling us what God said affliction means. Okay. Now we're going to discuss some biblical gaps. Okay? We're going, to under, we're going to investigate and understand why it is obvious, or I'll, I'll say this, why it is quite obvious or it can be obvious <laughs> to some, <laughs> that there is an oral law. Because we're going to see that you really cannot have any transmission of information without oral information being transmitted with the book that's being given. Okay? Um, let's go back to our story with the potential convert. He went to, the, to this great sage, Shammai, and he said, convert me. What did Shammai tell him? Shammai told him, he chased him away, actually. He said, you're an obnoxious nut, get away from me. <laughs> okay, that's what he told him. I, I don't know if it was those exact words, but uh, he chased him away with a yardstick. That's actually what the Talmud says. So where did he go? He went to uh, Shammai's associate and rival, okay? 
which was uh, Hillel. Hillel had a very different approach to things, as you may know. And Hillel said, oh, you want to convert with just based on the written law and not the oral law? That's fine. Let's begin studying together. And, and here's what Hillel does. So if you look up here, if you know the uh, Hebrew alphabet, this is, uh, you, you'll understand this, but you don't need to know it. This letter right here is an aleph. That is accurate. This is a bet. This is a vet. This is a gimel. All accurate. This is exactly what Hillel taught the potential convert the first day. The next day he comes back, and he just reverses it and tells him, whoop, there we go, and he tells him the aleph is not an aleph. He tells him it's a tough. It's the last letter in the alphabet. The bays he calls a sin, which is the second to last letter. And he continues giving him a whole new... And the converse, whoa, 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 one second. Yesterday you told me the complete reverse. So Hillel said, aha. So in order for you to know simply what the letters are in the Torah, you need to rely on my oral teachings to you. Do you realize that it's not possible for a person to read any book in any language unless they are relying on oral information that's being given to them by someone else? So he said, it is obvious that there needs to be oral information transmitted for someone to even read, never mind understand, the Torah. The convert understood, the potential convert got the message. He realized that Hillel was right, and he changed his viewpoint, and he converted, accepting the oral Torah as well as the written Torah. It's called the wisdom of a, an intelligent man. So, you know, that's a good salesman knows, right? Knows the beginning of the conversation. So he said, no oral law, that's fine. We'll work from there. Um, you with me? Okay, so it's clear from that that we need some more. And, you know, the, the um, Napoleon was the one who found the Rosetta Stone, right? What did the, what did, how did the Rosetta Stone help us? There were hieroglyphics in Egypt. No one knew what these different uh, symbols meant, how to read them. When he found the Rosetta Stone, which had hieroglyphics translated into two other uh, languages, one of them being Greek, we now were able to translate those images into what they, how to read those images. And suddenly we have the oral information. In that case, it was actually written in the stone. But, um, but now we have that information, which out with, we cannot understand the hieroglyphics. This is true in any single language. And this is a very simple way which Hill demonstrated to this individual that you need oral information in order to be able to understand what the Torah is even writing, what these letters even are. We're good? Any rebuttals? Any questions? Okay, now, another point, which is really along the same lines. Um, let's go to learning exercise number one. Okay, see that on page eight? Okay, we have three letters, B, R, D. No vowels, okay? I want you to come up with four or five versions of how you can put vowels into this word. This is like Scrabble, isn't it? And, uh, and, and come up with different words by adding only vowels. Breed, bread, board, bird, abroad, beard. Excellent, okay, great, fantastic. So what we see is, that when you have letters in any language without the vowels, we don't necessarily know the proper way to read the word. There are many ways we can read it. So imagine if the Torah said, do not, BR, do not go BRD. Okay? What is the Torah saying? Well, you can say that the Torah is saying, do not go abroad. Do not go bored. Right? Do not go bird. I don't think so. That doesn't work. Right? But... There are many, there are different things that, and we don't know what the Torah would be saying. Here's a, a fascinating thing, which you may know about Hebrew. I mean, here are a few. We have board, we have breed, abroad, beard. I know we had a few of those. When you look at a Torah, and if you can see that up here, you will see that the Torah has letters. But here's the funny thing about the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language doesn't have vowels in letter form. It has vowels in shape form, in symbol form, okay? And if you look at this over here, here they filled in the Torah with vowels, okay? On the bottom image. Okay, whether you can, can you see that back from back there? 
Uh, okay, you may be familiar with this. Regardless, the point is, every single word in the Torah is without vowels. So the problem we had with BRD, you have with every single word in the Torah. The good news is, and if you pick up an Israeli newspaper, by the way, uh, people are amazed because of this. Like, how do you read that without vowels? Now, the, the good news is, from context, you can, you can figure out what most words are. But there are many times where context does not explain how to read the word, and it really can be read in different ways, which will have completely different meanings, and the, and the verse will flow properly. So how do we know how to pronounce each word properly to get the right message out of the Torah? I'm going to give you a classic example you may be familiar with. Okay, You shall not cook a kid in its mother's milk. Right? This is where we get this whole milk and meat thing, you know, the whole Jewish kitchen thing, you know? Right? The great destruction of the Philly cheesesteak. So, um, <laughs> soy cheese, yeah. yeah. They, they tell me it doesn't taste the same. <laughs> okay, but anyway. Anyway, so um, now if you look at the Hebrew of this, here's the Hebrew. Then this is with the vowels. Do not cook a kid in its mother's milk. The word for milk is chalev. Okay? But if we just stick with the Hebrew, it says you shall not cook a kid in its mother's chalev. Now that word, I'm reading it chalev because that's, what the Torah, that's, what, that's how we know to read the Torah. But if you look at the word itself, it could be read as um, many things. One word it can be read at is chalev. Chalev is fat. You know a juicy, fatty steak? Fat. Fat from an animal. Do not cook a kid in its mother's fat. And that would be accurate. There's no way for us from the context to know whether it means milk or whether it means fat. And there's no reason to say one or the other. Both of them really are not a necessarily a logical commandment. Not to eat milk and meat together. Um, so how do we know how to read this? And this, is, and, and this affects majorly in our Jewish lifestyle. If someone's keeping kosher, this really has a significant impact. There's only one way we can know, and that is if someone taught us orally how to read that word, as Moses did when God told him how to read it at Mount Sinai. That's the only way we can possibly know, I, that I know that we can know how to read that word. And there are numerous examples of this that we can go through in the Torah where a word can be read in multiple ways and, in the, and the verse would make perfect sense. Interesting? Definitely interesting, right? You may not be convinced. I'm not really trying to convince you. I'm trying to open up your mind to possibilities, actually. So I'm just, that's what I would like to do. God, Moses writes down the written word that God tells him to write down. And God it gives him an oral explanation which is not written down. That's not written. It's not written down. Exactly. And we're going to see how he, in a technical way, how he actually passed it down. Okay, how he taught it and how many times he taught it, etc. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So I'm a. Just to me that maybe yeah. That had something to do. There, there's some discussion about some of what you're saying in the commentaries, but I'm happy you be, oh, began by saying this is a tangent. <laughs> I agree, it is. Because he, here's here's the main point that we want to. There's a there's a lot of discussion about this verse, and the meaning of the general verse. But we're just talking about. There's nothing that, is, that compels us to say it means milk. You're, you're raising an interesting point of why maybe we should say it means milk, but there is nothing compelling, and one can easily argue, well, there's no proof to that, and therefore I want to interpret it to mean fat and not milk. The only way we know, and it's universally accepted in the, amongst the Jewish people, that it's milk is that there is this oral tradition that it means milk. And even people who are, I would say there are people who are disturbed by this verse, but they still interpret it as milk. They never say, well, it means fat. No one ever says that. Uh, because we have a tradition, an oral tradition, that it means milk. And that's the point we're bringing out. Okay? The, the entire meaning of the verse is a subject in, uh, of its own. Okay, I hear, I hear what you're saying. I could argue that. I'm not going to do that now. Okay, and because the reality is, we know that the law is that it, it, it that it, it that it speaks of any meat in any milk, not just a mother's milk. How we know that it's another discussion. Um, so I don't want to get into all the tangents on this. But the bottom line is that we know that it's milk and not um, fat only through oral transmission, 
And that is from the received oral law. The rabbis didn't determine this. Moses taught this at Sinai orally as explaining this is what God explained to him the verse is saying. Let's go to something else. Punctuation. And you're going to love this. This is great. Okay, you ready for this, everyone? One second. I just hope I don't expose it. I got to do this slowly. One second. Okay. Okay. What? Well, let's not do that yet. Let's go to learning. <laughs> Sorry. Hopefully you didn't catch it. Learning exercise number two. Woman, let's go to learning exercise number two. It's a lot of fun. Woman without her man is nothing. How many of you strongly agree with this statement? How many of you somewhat agree with the statement? I, I um, somewhat disagree with the statement. How many of you vehemently disagree with this? Okay, great. Okay. I want you to know that if you raised your hand for I strongly disagree with the statement, I want you to know that I am personally very disappointed. <laughs> Now, before you hate me, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Your mind is just going into very bad places for no reason whatsoever. Because instead of reading, woman without her man is nothing, you should have read, woman without her man is nothing. <laughs> okay, okay, that was just for... <laughs> so if you think you stand for women's rights... And you had your, okay, so that's just for some humor. But here's the point. The point is that punctuation obviously can seriously transform completely into two opposite directions what a statement is saying. And the challenge with the Torah, once again, is that in the Torah, we don't have any punctuation. Punctuation in the Torah comes in the form of what is known as trup or ta'amim, which are the cantorial notes, symbols, which you have right over here. You can see them if you have good eyesight. <laughs> um, and there are cantorial notes which you don't, which are not written in the Torah. And so like when the, a Torah reader prepares the reading of the Torah and he masters the cantorial notes, he's got to do it from a book that has those notes because when he gets to the Torah, it's completely blank of vowels and notes. Now those notes also serve as punctuation. Okay, I'm going to show you an example from the Torah where, he, where this raises a problem. Well, here's just an example. If you can see the, he, the, the blue, the blue here, that's a punctuation. Here's a punctuation. Here's a punctuation and punctuation. Those are our cantorial notes and punctuation. Um, but here we have an example from the Torah. Just a minute here. Okay. The Torah says, Uva menorah, arba gevim. In the menorah, on the menorah, there were four cups, mishukadim. Okay, which Mishakad means decorated, kaftorel ufrachah, its knobs and its flowers. Now, I ask you this question. What was decorated? The Torah is saying something should be done. What, what is decorated? Is it, well, it, go to, look at the English. Do we have the English here? Um, look at the English. On the menorah shall be four goblets decorated, its knobs and its flowers. Is it saying the four goblets are decorated or the knobs and its flowers are decorated? Anyone? You can go anyway, for that matter. So well, no point in even arguing this one. Here's the point. If we put, whoop, if we put, I will complain to them about the colors here. But if we put the punctuation there, and that is actually a comma in, can, in, in, Torah, in, in Torah symbols, then it means the menorah had four cups, decorated um, knobs and flowers. Because the decorated, this word, Mishukadim, which means decorated, goes with the knobs and the flowers. However, if you put the punctuation here, then you're reading it. The menorah has four cups decorated, and it has knobs and flowers. So if you don't have the punctuation, you, cannot, you don't know how to make the menorah. And the Jews had the menorah for many, many years. How do we know how to make the menorah? Because God orally told Moses where to put the punctuation in every single verse. Yes? But what period of time did they start to put the vowels in punctuation? Great. So that's, a, that's an excellent uh, question. And for simplicity purposes, it goes back to the giving of the Torah at Mount, at Mount Sinai. That God gave this punctuation to Moses at Sinai, and we have it all the way back to that. The punctuation. Some say that the cantorial notes, which are not punctuations as well, came at a later time. 
but the punctuation goes all, all the way back to Sinai. And it, need, it, it has to have gone back to Sinai, otherwise we simply wouldn't know how to read the Torah. And here's, a, here's an interesting thing as well to observe. You know, if you go into any synagogue, any denomination, we all read the Torah the exact same way. We have the punctuation in the exact same place. We have the pronunciation of the words the exact same way. Right? Which is interesting, and we'll get to soon about the telephone game, because... It wasn't even a Blackberry. It, it wasn't even a Blackberry. He told them how to read the verse, and he knew how to read the verse and where the punctuations go. Okay, so when did they write them down? The punctuation? Yeah, much, later. much later on. We're gonna, and so if we have time, which I'm afraid we won't, but if we have time, we'll have a video about why the oral law, which we'll learn in a minute, was, was not allowed to be written down, ended up being written down. It's a good question. Very good. So we have, a, we have an Israeli amongst us who we can't pull any fast ones on him. Okay, so here's the thing. You're raising a good point. Um, so actually, actually, that may be a compelling reason to tell us how to read this, but you will find in the Torah situations where you have uh, the masculine and feminine terminologies put together, and there's a reason for that. So when we go through other places in the Torah, it wouldn't be a compelling argument because we see in other places that the words are put together in an ingrammatically correct way for a specific reason. The Torah is a very tricky book in that way uh, because it, it gives us very, uh, many subtle messages in very interesting ways. Okay? I mean, there are other verses as well that you won't have that compelling reason and we would not know how to read. But that was an ins insightful point that you caught on. So, very good. Okay. Um, getting the message, okay? Um, here's another major problem, and the major problem is simply, and we discussed this with the fasting, simply understanding what the Torah is saying in so many places is not possible if we just have the written text. I'm going to give you an example from some, of something that I believe most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with, it is the uh, famous verse from Deuteronomy of Shema Yisrael. Okay, we're going to read it in the English text number six. You shall inscribe them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. What's the Torah talking about? Mezuzahs. mezuzahs. Is everyone in agreement with that? Okay, that's actually what the Torah is referring to. What's a mezuzah? A scroll. A scroll. And what does it say on the scroll? The Shema. Do you see that explained? It says, you shall inscribe them. You know, it's like when my kids talk in, in pronouns. You know, they, them, that. What are you talking about? Tell me what that is and tell me who they are. Okay, <laughs> right? So, you shall inscribe them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. What is them and how should they be inscribed? I mean, it sounds to me like you should take an etching tool and engrave it in the stone doorway of your home. Where do we get this scroll business from, right? And, and if we go through this verse, which is the Shema, a very famous verse, these words that I command you to this day, that you command to you this day shall be upon your heart. What are these words? Which words? Yeah, and we would say, well, maybe it's the Shema, maybe it's the love of your God, but it could be a few things, right? You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand. What is them? The Torah gives us no explanation of what them is. We have another one. They shall be for, for totafot. There's no other word in the Torah, totafot. We don't even know what that word means. Rashi uh, has to help us out with that. Uh, be between your eyes, what are totafot? And then, of course, we have, you shall inscribe them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Yes? Tefillin, tefillin yeah. So we know it refers to tefillin, but, but how do we know that? And what are tefillin? And how do we know that tefillin should be black and they should be square and they need to have parchment inside of them and that they come with leather straps, right? Where do we get all of that from? Yeah. You shall inscribe them. Yeah. Okay. No, this word that I command you is before that. Yes, these words that I command you. And then if you read later on, then a word. Suppose. So which words is these words? The whole so when it says these words, exactly which words? The word that I command you, whatever the words are. These words that I command you should be right. What are these words? Is it hero Israel or is that you should love God? You can deduce it with the words that before. Okay, okay. Okay, fine. <laughs> I mean, but the general point you're following me with, especially with the other examples. Yes? Yeah, Gregory? Okay. 
I understand what you're saying. That one's a little bit more, uh, seems to be more implied than the other ones. Um, and so therefore we have, there's a, there's a great book. If you want to study um, some, um, I don't think it's deeply in-depth Jewish philosophy. This is a very valuable book. You can buy it on Amazon. It's translated into English. It's called The Kuzari. I highly recommend it. Okay? It's called The Kuzari. It's this next reading. So you just highlight. Text number seven. You see Rabbi Yehuda Levi Kuzari. It's a green book. If you're not sure, I will try and send it in the email following the class. And by the way, if you want to get the email following the class, make sure I have your email. Uh, give it to Anit on your way out if I don't have it, okay? And I'm going to include a link to where you can purchase it. It's a very valuable and worthwhile read, and it'll really help you in understanding Judaism. And he explains, essentially, and I'm going to paraphrase because of time, that there were Karaites during his time. The Karaites were a group of Jews who did not believe in the oral law. And he essentially asked them question after question of commandments in the Torah, and how do you understand this? Explain to me what all of this means. You know, the Torah forbids the consumption of animal fat. Well, which fat is, and some fat from the animal is permissible. Right? Thank God. Schmaltz. <laughs> what else would Jews do for heart attacks? So, um, <laughs> um, but how do you know which fats are kosher and which ones are forbidden? And he asked them that. How do you know? And there's no way of knowing. When the Torah says, let no man go out of his place on Shabbos, well, what does that mean? You have to stay in your chair? Can you go to your bed? Are you allowed to leave your house? What does that mean not to, uh, that no man can um, go out of his place on Shabbos? You know, and he goes on and on with one thing after another where it's just literally impossible to understand. Uh, the, what, is the, what are the details of circumcision? Exactly how do you do circumcision? When the Torah talks about fringes, what do fringes mean? What's a sukkah? When it tells us to sit in the sukkah, what's a sukkah? And what's interesting is the Karaites, being that they did not believe in the oral law, had no explanation. So they, what did they do? They came up with some version of what these things mean. They interpreted it, even though they didn't believe in interpretation. <laughs> because there's no way of dealing with the Torah unless you're ready to understand that in some way there is some interpretation or explanation, which we understand is, was given to Moses at Sinai through God explaining these mitzvahs to him. Okay, another, uh, another example of text number eight, the Torah tells us that the mitzvah that I'm prescribing to you today is not too mysterious or remote from you. It is very close to you, and you should choose life, I'm paraphrasing, so that you and your descendants will live, right? So the Torah is telling us to choose life, but the Torah is not explaining to us what life is. We don't even understand half the commandments in the Torah because the Torah is not explaining what they, how to observe them. Clearly, when the Torah is telling us choose life, choose the Torah, it has also given us the information of how to observe these things. Where's that information? It's the oral law that's been passed down to every single one of us so that every single one of us actually knows that you're supposed to fast on Yom Kippur. And how is it passed down to us? Because it was received by Moses at Mount Sinai. So it's the oral word of God as opposed to the written word of God. Um, another classic example in text number nine is God says, when God expands your borders, as he promised, as he promised you, and your natural desire to eat meat asserts itself so that you say, I wish to eat meat, you may eat as much meat as you wish. Okay? Now in the Hebrew it says, you shall slaughter from your um, animals and from your sheep which God has given you as I have commanded you. Okay? And that's the you need only slaughter your cattle and small animals that God will have given you in the manner that I have prescribed. There is nowhere in the Torah where God prescribes how to slaughter an animal. Okay? So what does this mean? And we actually have a very defined way of slaughtering an animal. In fact, it's such a precise um, uh, um, uh, process of slaughtering an animal that we only that you know many people will only eat meat that was slaughtered by an individual who they believe is God fearing because the only way to truly know whether the animal was slaughtered in the precise movement is relying on the integrity of the slaughterer and so we have a very precise way which has been the same way in all of Jewish time how do we know that where did we get the prescribed way from the Torah doesn't explain it in any place. Clearly, it seems that there was oral information God gave Moses in explaining what he was saying. Okay. There's also, um, okay, let's talk about, how are we doing, everyone? Any major issues here? Um, 
And it's not a very question, and I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of people are thinking about that. So, number one, we're going to see that when Moses received the Torah, the written and oral, he immediately taught the Torah um, four times. So he had a, a, a review, a very healthy review. Okay, that's number one. Number two, and this is going to be more difficult to digest, but to me it's a reality. Um, there, were, there were rabbis in our generation, and there probably are today still, rabbis in our generation, okay? Definitely rabbis I know who have, have since passed on, who knew the entire Talmud, which is, I think, far greater than the Torah, by word for word. If you told them a page, they can read the whole page to you without looking into the, into the Talmud, right? So we need to understand that there are people who are, I wouldn't even call them, in our generation, I would say they're highly gifted. If you go back to the times of the Talmud even, which is still way after the giving of the Torah, that wasn't so highly gifted. There were many, many people who had that scope of knowledge. To me, I'm blown away by that. No, there's no question. But I'm also aware of the fact that there were many, many people who had that scope. So even that information um, for someone like Moses is not what actually made him very impressive. I mean, to us, that makes him very impressive. But at, at that time, now that may be a hard for, uh, and that may be harder for us to digest, but I know that historically. So I'm saying how I relate to that. I mean, I know, okay? <laughs> yes. Um, it seems so, yes. It depends when you mean, did it exist? You mean, were the Jews speaking it? Yes. Was it spoken? Or I believe so. I believe so, yes. Moses didn't have to learn language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting if Moses spoke Hebrew with an accent, right? <laughs> okay. Um, if you can remember to send me an email with that question, I will just, uh, I'll try and verify that. Absolutely, okay? Um, okay, let's talk about the benefits of the oral law. Because, you know, one of the questions that we had in the beginning was, why did God set it up this way? Okay, very nice, so it's obvious. It seems very clear that God gave in oral information with the written law, but why did he do that? Why didn't he just give someone, was God short on paper? Was this a, tw uh, a tweet that you only get 144 words or something like that? I mean, <laughs> what was the problem? God was running out of ink. What was the issue that God couldn't just write down all of the oral and give us a, just a bigger book, you know? Jews have, uh, you know, five books of Moses is five books. I have hundreds of books in my house. You know, give me a Torah with it. It's made up of an encyclopedia. I'm okay with that. At least it's giving me clarity. Yeah. Bill, you had a question? Yeah. Well, to clarify it. To... to So wouldn't it be better if we just had it all written down? Now we have the concern of the telephone game of... Less personal. It's less personal. Excellent point. I'm going to get to that point soon. That's a very good point. And we're going to understand why personal is very important here. Very good. We have another book which was written a couple hundred years ago. It's still debated. Constitution. <laughs> Excellent. Bravo. Let's go right to the Constitution, everybody. But here's something I want to tell you. I don't want your political opinions. Okay? Leave them outside of this room. Okay? So if you, if you pulled up in a pickup truck and you have eight rifles behind it, that's fine. I, I, I have no opinion tonight on the subject. And if you came up with a sticker, you know, uh, what's the, I don't even know the, the, the signs here, but whatever, you know, whatever the bumper sticker would say to say you're anti-guns, that's fine. Just leave it on your car. Okay? Um, here's for the first thing. Before we get to the, the, the Constitution, let's go to text number 10. Where are we up to? You are not at liberty to speak the oral Torah from a text. Okay. Why didn't we, don't we have the oral law written as part of the written law? Because it, the Talmud tells us that it was forbidden to Moses to write down the oral law. What does that tell us? God wanted a written law and an oral law. And that raises a big crooked letter question. Why? Right? Why? Um, what are the adva some advantages of a system of oral transmission in comparison to studying from a written, from a written text? We're going to discuss three advantages to having oral information and not having everything written down. Okay? 
Advantage number one is avoiding ambiguity, and we're going to go to the Constitution to understand this. Constitution, you're probably, most of us, if not all of us, are probably familiar with this debate. A Second Amendment, United States Constitution, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Does this mean that an individual has the right to bear arms, or does it mean that it's only giving right to a for the security of a free state to a militia? It does, should we only have the police and the army are, um, you know, touting guns, or should every private citizen have the right to protect themselves with guns? And you know what it boils down to? It boils down to the Constitution, this amendment being written in a fashion which was probably very well understood when it was written, but years later can very easily be argued based on the way it was written. What's the problem? When you have a written law written down, 200, 500 years later, the mentality of the people changes, the way they read the language changes, and they suddenly are not clear about what you intended in the way you wrote it. That's a very big problem, with, which gives us ambiguity. Yes? We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Okay? We're going to get to that. The, the telephone game is where you can write. We're going to get to the telephone game soon. Okay? We're going to get to the weaknesses of the oral law. Now we're talking about the advantages of the oral law. Okay? One advantage is that it offers us a definition to written text which can end up being ambiguous at a later time. So the written word on its own, which we always think is the best way to give over information, ends up not being the best way, especially when it's information that you want transmitted from generation to generation. Okay, let's look at this text, learning exercise number four. Join up with the person next to you and let me know if you can tell me what this recipe is, please. This was written in English. Is there a problem? <laughs> so here we go. Um, oil sops. It already, lost, it already lost my attention. Uh, take a good quantity of onions and mince them not too small and seethe in fair water. Then take them up and take a good quantity of stale ale as three gallons and thereto take a pint of oil fried and cast the onions thereto and let all boil together a good while. Then cast thereto saffron power, powered... It's misspelled. Powdered pepper, sugar, and salt, and serve forth all hot as toasts. Mazel tov. Okay. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, this was actually written in our language, in our, in our mother tongue, in English. And, uh, and yet, we don't, we're not quite sure, you know, five centuries later, or is this even ten centuries later? Yeah, five centuries later, we're not even sure what this is saying. That is the weakness of, or, of written law being given only in, in, in written form without any oral explanation. What you have an oral explanation, this is something that Bill said we're going to get to even more, is what you have an oral explanation is you have facial expressions, you have gestures, eye contact, posture, so much more meaning is given, inflection, so much more meaning is given over when someone is actually teaching. That's the reason why, actually, you know, some, you know I put all of our audio of these classes, um, which you pay to attend on the internet for free. And you probably all know that because I, I, I send you an email with links, right? Now, some people may be concerned that, well, why should they not come to the class, right? Now, the first thing is, um, we're not a business. I want to actually get the information out there. So, you know, hey, however you, however you study, it's, it's fine with me. However, I also believe that you're going to choose to come here and not just listen to it online because, boy, I mean... If, it's, if a class is boring, imagine how boring that is, right? <laughs> but in a, in a class, you can see my inflection. You can, you, can, you can sort of feel me. We're in the same room together. And so the message, you know, in the class is much more dynamic when it's in person, when we see other people, the reactions, the questions. It's a whole different experience. Um, and that's why it's important to also have that oral transmission. Let's go to another. That's one advantage of, or of the oral law. Another advantage of oral law is superior learning. Okay, superior learning. And, you know, like, like um, uh, Michael asked, you know, how did Moses remember all of this? 
Well, he probably paid attention when the guy was talking, right? And, and here's an interesting thing. The, the interesting thing is that when, when, when a student actually records a class, a student records a class, right? If you were to come here and you say, oh, let me put on the recorder just in case, you know, that gives you permission to doze off or, you know, not pay so much attention. And guess what? You actually do not learn as well when you record a class as opposed to when you have to hear it now, otherwise you won't get it. You have to learn much better. So there's a huge advantage to oral law versus written law. And you know it's in the books. I mean, I, I will make a confession. I took Regents. I'm, uh, I'm from New York. And when I was in high school, and um, there were certain subjects which I didn't really pay much attention to during the year. And I took the, uh, the Barron's you know, review books or whatever it was. I did a crash course myself because it was subjects that I was able to do that with. Not many, but a few. And... Um, I learned the whole thing and took the test, right? Why? I didn't have to listen to the teacher because I had it in the book, which means I wasn't paying attention. I probably didn't learn it nearly as well as I would have had I listened to the teacher, but I'll never admit to that. Um, <laughs> but you see, you understand this. There's a huge advantage to when a teacher is teaching. Again, it's much more dynamic, and you get much more when it's being taught orally as opposed to when you're just reading it. Yeah, well, it uh, depends on the, uh, a, few, a few elements, but we're not going to go there now. <laughs> we're going to assume that your teacher tonight is a good teacher. Um, let's read text 13. Moses was commanded at Sinai to teach all of these laws orally and not to record them in writing, so that we would not rely on recorded information that would be readily available, as that would result in a laxity of study. When something is not recorded and its preservation requires of us to learn it by heart, we study it with more concentration and we continuously contemplate the material in order to ensure we remember it and do not forget it. Excellent. So we simply learn better when we have to pay attention. There's one other point that we have to pay attention to, which is text 14, which I'm just going to uh, paraphrase, and that is Torah study... You see, we live in a model, I believe in our, in, 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 our, uh, in our Western society, that we live in a model of being trained to value the end result. If there's no end result, there is no value. And here's something interesting with Torah study. Torah study's value is not in coming out with a useful piece of information. Torah study is about engaging with the wisdom of God, thereby connecting in a deeper way with God. So we can study subjects in the Talmud which have no relevance to our personal lives, and yet they have value. Right? Um, so simply studying, the value of study is a great value in Judaism for study's sake in and of itself. And that's why the study of oral law, which emphasizes greater study, has such value. The last advantage, the third advantage of oral law is that it forces a student to have a teacher. And this goes again back to what Bill said in a deeper way. It forces a student to have a teacher. When someone has a teacher, they have a mentor. They have a role model. They have someone who can give them personal guidance. It changes our whole experience and interaction with the Torah. You know, it's like trying to do, uh, take on any type of a commitment in life, doing it alone versus doing it with a group. What's the value of Weight Watchers? One of the great values of Weight Watchers is you're going on a scale in front of a group next week, right? That has great value. You also have a mentor who's going to ask you how you're doing and also give you advice. You're saying, hey, this isn't working. They'll give you advice. Well, try this. That has great value as opposed to just reading from a book. Reading a diet from a book versus doing it with another person. Studies have shown that people go much further when they do something collectively than they do it, than doing it alone. That's why um, uh, groups are very, very valuable, small groups in people who are trying to accomplish something in life. Okay, let me address, and this is going to take a few minutes, so we need to give it some time, address the broken telephone. This is the disadvantage of the oral law. There's a huge disadvantage to transmitting things orally, and that is, is it going to be transmitted properly, right? Is it going to? So we're going to test it out, okay? We're going to test out what we all know, okay? But we just want to prove that, okay? So I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to go over to Stan, can I start with you? I'm going to give you a message, Stan. I'm going to whisper it into your ear, and you're just going to pass it down. 
Okay, we'll just pass it down. You can't mess this up. Don't worry. It's going to be messed up by the time we get, and we'll, we won't know who did it. Okay? <laughs> okay. So here's where the, where the original message was. That's pretty good. Uh, here, the original message was, not everything that can be counted counts. Not everything that counts can be counted. Okay. We got the message generally, but we definitely did not get the full, the full sentence, right? And that's clear. We know this. We know the telephone game. It's a matter of time. And the way we pr every person processes it a little bit differently, and it ends up changing. So, and that's a problem. And that is our big question about the telephone game. Correct? Okay. Um, now, what's interesting is... Um, What's interesting is that, that Maimonides specifically counts, he, he, he gives the names of everyone from Moses to his time, counting every single person in the next generation, the leader of every single generation, or I, um, it may be to the end of the time of the Talmud, to show how the oral information was transmitted from generation to generation. Let's read text 15a. This doesn't answer the question yet, but I just want you to understand some things here. Let's read text 15a. Okay, excellent. So we see that everyone actually learned it four times. So we have repetition. That's why I was telling you not to repeat. Here we have repetition that, the, that everyone is learning it repeatedly. And in fact, we're taught that we should, everything we study in the Torah, we should study at least four times. Here's another point, text 15b. Okay. Point is that it was reviewed and reviewed and questioned until it was well understood and they digested it. That's number one, the oral law. Okay. Now, it doesn't safeguard us yet from our telephone game, but it helps out uh, tremendously. And then the text 15c tells us how Moses, before he died at the end of the 40 years, asked anyone if they have any questions. And any questions that came up, he reviewed with them to make sure that there was clarity. Um, and then it was passed down from generation to generation, and we know the leader of every single generation from the time of Moses going all the way down. Um, so here's an interesting thing about the oral law. When you transmit oral information, you have a problem with the telephone game. People actually end up having different, a different message a few generations down. However, when you have a, an oral law that's based on a written law, so it's not, it's not an oral law which is on its own, but it's an oral law that's tied to verses in the Torah, you're anchored and it gives the, the transmission of the oral law a much higher chance of being transmitted properly by way of example fasting on Yom Kippur which was transmitted properly to every single one of us right and we can use countless examples of so many things in the Torah which were transmitted and we all and, and Jews in all four corners of the earth are actually observing in the exact same way so we're going to do an exam we're going to test this uh, 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 by way of example just a moment Make sure. Okay, this is what we're going to do. I have these letters on the sheet over here, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to transmit a sentence which is, which is associated to these letters, although clearly these letters mean nothing without my message, and we're going to see how that transfers over down the line, okay? Okay. The shy green lion had too much to drink and fell out the window. <laughs> okay. We did have a slight, um, a slight, I think, language barrier here, um, but what? But we, we were, I mean, we were 95 percent, I think. Yeah. yeah, the shy green line had too much to drink and fell out the window. Point being that when you have a text which may not be clear, but it does associate with the information, it's much easier to transfer that information accurately. The proof that this works is by the fact that now, let's say someone gets it wrong, right? But let's say 50 people are getting it right. Clearly, we know where to go. And clearly, this has been working because the Jewish people, in our main observances outside of customs, which we'll talk about at a different point, is we're all doing the same thing. Our tefillin all look the same, right? And, and we found tefillin, the archaeologists found tefillin, which look exactly like our tefillin. And that's because the oral transmission with a written text supporting it works very, very well. And so what we, what we uh, hopefully have uh, understood from tonight is this, that there's a you know, there are very obvious questions as to why we should be relying on an oral law and why God would give a Torah that has not only a written law but an oral law. But what we have learned is that there are some big advantages to having an oral law and not only having 
a written law. It removes ambiguity. It makes us study much better. It gives us teachers. There is a big risk with oral law in that you have the telephone game issue. But that's resolved because usually when we're playing the telephone game, we only are transmitting oral information. But the moment we attach oral information being linked to text, that solidifies oral information and secures a much better result at the end of that telephone game. The proof is our history of over 3,300 years we are, where we are all ending up in different corners of the world with the same results. We're going to conclude with a, a short um, video discussing why at a later period in Jewish history, even though it was forbidden to write down the oral law, the oral law ended up being written down by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince, um, and this was in the uh, second century, I believe. The five books of Moses, known as the written Torah, was accompanied by an oral tradition passed down from teacher to pupil for over a thousand years. During this time, these ideas were not formally committed to writing, and in fact, it was prohibited to do so. The intention was for students to learn directly from teachers and to accept personal responsibility for preserving the teachings for the next generation. Yet, toward the end of the second century, the oral Torah was recorded in a book known as the Mishnah. Why did this happen? And who had the audacity to change the status quo? Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was head of the Sanhedrin. His piety, Torah scholarship, and wisdom earned him the name Rabbeinu HaKodesh, our holy teacher. It was he who made the momentous decision to record the oral law. The situation of the Jews was precarious. The might of the Roman Empire had spread its tentacles and ruled over the Jewish people in Israel. Around a hundred years earlier, the Romans had destroyed the Second Temple. Countless Jews were killed, forced into exile, and sold into slavery. Similar atrocities occurred a few decades later, when the Romans crushed the Bar Kokhba rebellion. At certain points, the study of Torah was forbidden on pain of death. Religious practices were banned, and Torah sages were murdered. An oral method of transmission has advantages, but it can only flourish when people are living together in peace with a strong presence of scholars and teachers. However, under the circumstances of oppression and dispersion that existed at the time, an oral means of transmission was not advantageous as it jeopardized the accurate preservation of these treasured teachings. Considering these realities, Rabbi Yehuda made the bold decision to record the Oral Torah. Indeed, over the next 2,000 years, the Jewish people often experienced great suffering, dispersions, and weakening of scholarship. Were it not for Rabbi Yehuda's revolutionary vision in writing down the Mishnah, many sacred teachings and practices would have been lost forever. <laughs>